largely homeless people and what is uh, and the way it's being regulated in cities. We're also looking at uh, university campuses, which is what I'll talk about later this afternoon. And we're looking at uh, city streets and questions of community policing. And we're looking at uh, redevelopment areas. And in each one, the question is, how do publics form? What do they do? How can they be political uh, under changing circumstances? So that's what I'm going to talk about today in the 30 minutes that I have here. Um, this is the text for my sermon. Uh, it's from uh, Ray Paul, uh, writing in 1970, a radical planner, Ray Paul, 1970. So right around the same time that David Harvey is beginning to make his shift from a liberal to a socialist perspective in social justice in the city. And Ray Paul writes in Whose City, which is where we got our title from, certainly the dialogue between revolutionaries and gradualists must continue and not only those too complacent or too selfish to consider the plight of those less privileged than themselves can constitute the common enemy. For the rest of us, the argument is not about aims, but about the speed and methods of change. Certainly, we are moving into a future with a greater potential for conflict, and the need for political organization seems evident. Whose city will depend on whose power? The question of whose city remains vitally important, we think, and maybe even probably more important now as it was more than 40 years ago when Ray Paul asked the question. The intervening years have shown not only is the question of whose city a question of whose power, it is also a question of what politics. We mean that in both senses. What kind of politics is at work in the contemporary city? And is there even a politics at work? Has non-contention become the norm in urban space? Is the city governed, except in exceptional circumstances, by what Andy Merrifield, in his recent appreciation of Ray Paul's work, called non-accountable post-political middle managers whose machinations are about as publicly transparent as mud? In the context of the recent global financial crisis, developments in Denver provide some interesting opportunities to reflect on these questions, which is what we propose to do today. In the time allotted, we obviously cannot be more than telegraphic. In fact, I will not even talk about what might be much the most interesting case we've examined in Colorado, which is the struggle by homeless people to get an anti-camping ordinance repealed in the city of Boulder. But we hope in telling our stories today that will be pro provocatively telegraphic. Maybe even advancing, if only a little bit, that dialogue between revolutionaries and gradualists that Paul talked about. And maybe also showing that the need for political organization is being met, if not always in the ways that one might predict. So let me get on with the stories. Redevelopment plans were in full swing at Denver's former airport, Stapleton, when the economic crisis hit in 2008. One of the largest planning efforts in the United States and designed largely along new urbanist principles uh, under the auspices of Forest City Stapleton, a division of Forest City Enterprises, which is a massive community builder, as they call themselves, Stapleton's first residents arrived in 2002. There are now more than 17,000 and some 4,600 single-family homes and 700 rental apartments. At build-out, which was originally projected for the year 2015 but has been considerably delayed, Stapleton is expected to host a population of 30,000 people in 12,000 single-family homes and 4,000 apartments. One result of the economic crisis, <clears throat> excuse me, one result of the economic crisis was sign a significant slowing of the rate of single, uh, uh, the rate of construction of rental properties, as well as the rate of construction of below market rate single family housing. Whereas 40% of the projected number of single family market rate housings, housing had been built. Uh, only 17.5% of the rental units have been built. This is by 2010. Despite a legally binding agreement that Forest City build affordable housing in June 2010, there are only 226 units of affordable housing for sale. The problem in 2010, according to a Forest City representative that we interviewed, was that we can't get financing for them. 
for either rental units or below market for sale housing. One result, according to this official, is that Stapleton is now racially and economically less diverse than it was when it first opened. Decreasing diversity is, in this instance, a natural feature of the market. And this worried Steve Lawrence, the president of Stapleton United Neighbor, Neighbors, or SUN, as he told us in an interview, he was concerned that Stapleton was developing some because of economics into a yuppie or walled neighborhood that just doesn't have walls or gates. By 2010, he said, the whole affordable housing goal has been missed by two-thirds. There was a gulf he went on between the dream of the neighborhood and what it is becoming. Sun was thus beginning to develop a plan, or at least beginning to advocate for, the banking of land within Stapleton's various neighborhoods so that there that when, when there was a financing market to build it, Stapleton would not end up with a segregated community of affordable housing units at the far northeast corner of near Adams County, which is way the hell out there, almost in uh, Garth's old neighborhood of Kansas. Almost. Uh, rather than the mixed neighborhoods uh, outlined in the development plan. While while Lawrence, Steve Lawrence, admitted that some in Stapleton's wealthier neighborhoods might not agree, he thought it was vital for Sun to advocate for mix, mixing in affordable housing and creating an integrated community. Banking land for future affordable development was the means to this end, even as he agreed that it was often the case that affordable stuff is often what gets built last, as we put it to him in an interview. Affordable housing was not supposed to be built last. Beginning with the announced closure of Stapleton Airport in, in the 1980s, the city of Denver engaged in an intense planning process. It was professionally led and dominated, but planning efforts included more than 100 community meetings, charrettes, and hearings aimed at fully incorporating what they called the wide spectrum of the Denver community. In particular, these events were designed to assure popular buy-in to the large-scale redevelopment. The result was a green book, that is a master plan, that both outlined the overall vision for redevelopment and detailed specific rules governing the mix of housing, including tenure type and so cost and so forth. The location of community spaces and requirements for mixed commercial and residential areas, among other things. The development of affordable housing was required to be holistically integrated into the overall development. But this has not been accomplished as the market has come to trump such mandates. Now a second story. Across town, across the city, in La Alma, the La, La Alma Lincoln Park neighborhood, activists were also thinking about land banking and land trusts in 2010. The South Lincoln Park public housing development of 270 units is being remade as a mixed income new urbanist development called Mariposa, which means butterfly, and branded as a creative urban community with a Latino flair. While no subsidized units will be lost, indeed they'll be augmented by 100 units of subsidized senior housing, they will be dispersed around the neighborhood, a neighborhood where the term gentrification is appropriate in the words of a local artist and activist and is of great concern. Within the South Lincoln Park redevelopment, more than half of the housing will be sold at market rates, stretching up to $380,000 for a three-bedroom townhouse which is actually a significant amount of money if you're not all that familiar in US dollars. For some in the neighborhood, the South Lincoln Park redevelopment represents a victory of good planning. As at Stapleton, the planning process was intense and designed to be inclusive. Much written material concerning the project was prepared in four languages, including Mai Mai for the Somali residents, and planners went door to door with translators to encourage residents to attend community meetings and planning charrettes. David Griggs, the artist activist that I quoted just a second ago, thinks that the planning is a really good example of a lot of interests of a lot of interests 
uh, which maybe are not competing, but parallel or just missing each other, who have come together to recognize this great opportunity to redevelopment South Link redevelop South Lincoln and do more with the redevelopment because of the need to improve South Lincoln housing. South Lincoln redevelopment represents perhaps a better option than what has happened in the Santa Fe Arts District right next door and into which some of the low incoming renters will presumably be dispersed. The Arts District, according to one of its administrators, was a really non-happening area when we took over these mostly abandoned warehouses and started making them really cool. Then what happened was, okay, the developers out there, when things were going well, the developers come in and try to buy up the property and make expensive condos and all of that kind of thing. That started happening and they started tearing down these little houses and we were all up in arms about that. Then the economy went down. This is a story of gentrification and seesaw development, right? $500,000 condos were started and never finished and the building sites were abandoned. The crisis put a major stop to the neighborhood's gentrification. Given these abandoned sites and many other empty lots, we're hoping to maybe put together a land trust or something to buy these up and keep them in the arts, to keep these developers from developing. Because of the economic crisis, this is the time to do it, to get some financing, some funding, put together and maybe put a hold on some of these spaces that are for sale. If for slightly different reasons, in this case to preserve the possibility of retaining artists in an art district, activists in the Santa Fe and Lincoln Park and La Alma neighborhoods, like those at the old Stapleton Airport, hit on an essentially market-based solution to a market problem. Coupled with the dispersal of subsidized housing throughout the area, a South Lincoln Park was remade into mixed income Mariposa. Activists hoped that the great concern, that is gentrification, might be held at bay. Or as one of the South Lincoln Park planners told us, gentrification is going to happen. It's already happening. The terminology isn't mitigated, it's having managed gentrification. For us, it's how do we keep residents that are there now comfortable through the change and following the change, and how do we allow a place for their kids that are growing up there now to make a choice to live in the neighborhood so that they can afford it. They're welcome. They'll feel culturally comfortable. That is how you manage gentrification. These two stories of redevelopment in Denver seem to add credence to the hypothesis that we now live in a post-political age, one in which planning itself is now post-political. There seems to be a consensus that the poor or working class ought to be included in redeveloped space. There is a sense that inclusiveness is a value to be promoted, as is the imperative of participatory planning. But all of this is so within a given political economic situation, the boundaries of which are uncontestable. How to include the poor, who are not a natural part of the order, is thus a technical question, one of management, not a more primary or ontological question. And in both Stapleton and Lincoln Park La Alma, something like land banks become a viable technical answer. But even before that, difference and inclusiveness seem already to be accounted for as a matter of policy or of what Ranciere tells calling calling calls tellingly the police or la police, which is all the activities which create order by distributing places, names, functions. In post-politics, contention or dissensus, particularly over fundamental ways of seeing, knowing, and understanding the world, give way before hegemonic consensus building among stakeholders. That is, those who already have a stake in the existing order of things, however unevenly distributed. The post-political frame, Swingedow argues, is structured around the perceived inevitability of capitalism and a market economy as the basic organizational structure of the social and economic order, for which there is no alternative. The corresponding mode of governmentality is structured around dialogical forms of consensus formation, technocratic management, and problem-focused government governance sustained by populist discursive 
oppressive regimes. Regimes geared not to replacing elites, but calling on elites to undertake action. Such consensus building displaces what's called politics proper, which according to Ranciere is when the natural order of domination is interrupted by the institution of a part of those who have no part. Politics proper arises, Eric Swingadow summarizes, when the given order of things is questioned, when those whose voice is only recognized as noise by the police order claim the right to speak. As such, it disrupts the order of being, exposes the constituent antagonisms, and voids the constituent uh, and voids that constitute the police order and tests the principle of equality. Politics proper in this view is thus a fundamental contestation of the world as it is. Post-politics, on the other hand, is at best a maneuvering within a set of uncontested givens. In their intensely participatory planning processes, in the solicitousness of many residents and activists for the welfare and inclusion of poor or otherwise marginalized residents, and in the attempts by planning and development officials to account for difference, both Stapleton and Lincoln Park La Alma exhibit the hallmarks of a post-political dialogical form of consensus formation that Swingadow sees as central to post-politics. Perhaps this is not surprising, because as Gordon MacLeod has recently argued, new urbanism is paradigmatically post-political. It is a vital example of how dissent is not even recognized. The big issues, such as whether there should be redevelopment or redevelopment at all, are decided in advance, and the role for the public is only to shape that design, not the fact of development. For Susan Feinstein, that new urbanist gesturing towards citizen engagement may be less participatory than conscripting. The point is sharpened by Almendinger and Houghton, writing in 2012. Focusing on the United Kingdom, or more specifically England, they argue that the spatial planning Spatial planning, which is the paradigm of the 2000s, created a system that is not so much an empowering arena for debating wide-ranging societal options for future development as a system focused on carefully stage-managed processes with subtly but clearly defined parameters of what is open for debate. While the system gives the superficial appearance of engagement and legitimacy, it is primarily focused on delivering growth expedited through some carefully choreographed processes for participation, which minimize the potential for those with conflicting views to be given even a meaningful to be given a meaningful hearing. In post-political planning, contestation and conflict is supplanted by consensus-based politics in ways that foreclose all but narrow debate and contestation around a neoliberal growth agenda. In their view, therefore, consensus is a democratic problem, not the answer to democracy's problems, since it renders fundamental disagreement near invisible in arrangements choreographed by experts experts and managers to render them largely apolitical. Planning itself is a process of conscription, Almendinger and Houghton suggest, a means of achieving both what they call buy-in and lock-in. Planning in this sense, according to Ronan Patterson, becomes a technical, a technique of consensual persuasion. To understand the planning and redevelopment process in Denver in this manner might go some way and maybe even a long way in helping to explain the absence of serious contention in or over the spaces that are to be redeveloped. Where one might expect to find real contention over gentrification displacing long time or poorer residents, over the inclusion of subsidized housing within essentially middle or upper class neighborhoods, or over fundamental differences in lifestyle between long time residents, for example, and those redevelopment planners hope to attract, or 
or over visions of what housing is, whether it's a right or a commodity, there seems to be very, very little contention. And there seems to be a strong efforts to channel and control what difference and contention there is in productive directions, as with efforts to manage gentrification. Contention or dissensus over gentrification seems impossible. Gentrification is going to happen. All that will be possible is to manage its effects. Similarly, questions of managing cross-cultural conflict, of assuring comfort rather than overt contention is important in Stapleton. In recognizing that cultural clashes of some sort might be inevitable in a redevelopment that seeks to mix classes, Sun is seeking to implement a mediation service to adjudicate disputes between neighbors, such as between a resident rebuilding a car in a garage or driveway and neighbors who think that that is culturally unacceptable or who object to the noise that it might entail before somebody, as we were told, calls the city inspector. The goal in both cases is to resolve conflict without necessarily addressing the structural reasons for that conflict. The assumption is that the contention is a, fundam is a function of misunderstanding or of misaligned goals rather than a fundamental antagonism that might have its re roots beyond the individuals involved. The evidence seems to be, to be there, then, that something like the post-political hypothesis is valid. It is hard to find anything like politics proper, at least as defined by Ranciere and developed by Swingadao, at work in these redevelopment projects, even if we noted, Lynn and Kafwi and I noted, and <clears throat> more than once in our field notes, that there seemed to be palpable but indescribable tensions in every one of the neighborhoods we examined. It felt like contention was lurking just below the surface, invisible, confirming to a degree Ranciere's argument that post-political practice is geared towards managing the visible order. But to say we live in a post-political age or suffer under a post-political condition is to say only half of what needs to be said. Actually, contentious, fundamental, even properly political politics is not all that hard to find on Colorado's front range. A fuller version of our argument here turns to the case of homeless people's struggle to have the city of Boulder's anti-camping ordinance repealed, a struggle in which contention is clear and the visible order is anything but maintained. Fundamental challenges to the existing order are certainly being made in Boulder. But not only for reasons of time, I'm not going to talk about that today. The more important reason to not talk about it is that it's in fact too easy a case for exposing the infirmities of the post-political argument. What is more, what's more interesting is how if we look again at Lincoln Park La Alma and at Stapleton, we can also see there the fallacy of the assumption that we live in a post-political age. Politics proper pops up in all kinds of unexpected ways and in all kinds of unexpected places. Residents of South Lincoln Park, soon to be Mariposa, have been pushing for years, for example, to assure that all communication from Denver, the Denver Housing Authority, all communications are translated into all relevant languages. As one resident said, we had a flyer that came out when they stopped giving us zero rent. That is, they changed the formulas uh, under which uh, rent was calculated. It had 11 different languages on it. But for other communications, including announcements about the home's redevelopment, which is going to displace people, and the planning process, DHA, the Denver Housing Authority, claims it takes too much money to make all these translations. But they pay their rent. Why can't they get it in their language? That's what I'm saying. It's not fair. They live here. They pay their rent. Every time now, they only put it in two languages. There is a deeply political argument here about the natural order of things, that is, economics limiting political involvement. Activists are working hard, if not always quite so visibly, not, uh, excuse me, not so, so visibly, to disrupt 
this argument, this order. Significantly, such disruption is framed through the order, not just against it. Even as the housing authority and planners seek the full incorporation of residents, the partiality of their attempts opens up dissensus, a full questioning of the basis upon which incorporation, such as rent paying, is enacted. Over time, residents have organized to disrupt the housing authority and in doing so to claim a fuller voice in both the operation of the housing project and of the develop redevelopment project. And they've been quite effective. When the plans for South Lincoln's redevelopment were first put forward, there was no plan to guarantee rehousing in Mariposa for those who are displaced from the public housing. Organized residents won that right, the right to stay on site during redevelopment if space permitted, or to be provided with equivalent housing elsewhere with a first right of return if it did not. Such a right was not part of the original Housing Authority redevelopment plans. Residents also assured that the local elected residence council was empowered to vet new and returning residents in order to exclude those who had too many calls, too many complaints, those who are involved in drug activity. That resident wouldn't be able to come back. Residents acting democratically in this instance fundamentally reframed both how the housing authority understood the process of redevelopment and the meaning of displacement and the logic upon which exclusions were to operate, as well as the distributions of at least some of the power to affect those exclusions. Residents in South Lincoln take a lot for granted. Of course, who doesn't take a lot for granted? The, le the language of entrepreneurialism and the naturalness of neighborhood change, for example, as well as the basic acceptance of economic and class difference in the urban landscape is rife in all of our interviews. So across a number of interviews with residents in the wider area is the notion that homeowners have a different kind of interest in the neighborhood than do renters. So are notions of individual empowerment. But these are far from everything, and they are conditioned, in fact, they are shaped by a fundamental and quite profoundly different sense of what community is than might be found in either the boosterish new urbanist literature or the dismissive talk of superficial incorporation that marks the post-political literature. Activist residents in South Lincoln Park homes, hardly naive to the relations of power that govern their lives, are strategically disruptive of or strategically cooperative with state institutions like the Denver Housing Authority. Their consent, the dampening down of contention, of dissensus, must, their consent must be won. A fact and a process that the po post-political hypothesis seems to have no ability to account for. In, it, in the post-political hypothesis, people are either actively oppositional or passively sheepish. Redevelopment in places like South Lincoln and its wider neighborhood is not post-political. It is post-political, it is political right from the start. Where the housing authority has contracted with consultants to brand the neighborhood into Mariposa for a new class of incomers, those who are already living there have claimed the right not just to be heard, but to shape and transform the project and to retain their space in it. To their credit, planners on the ground have actually understood this which is to say they have understood that planning redevelopment is never given. The idea to create a land trust as a means to forestall inevitable gentrification takes on a different cast in the light of this discussion. It can be understood as an attempt, however imperfect or incomplete, to implement a form of commons within a struggled over neighborhood, a form of property and social relations that, while not disconnected from properties functioning as exchange value, which is the hegemonic form of property that makes gentrification appear natural, nonetheless it operates on different principles. Indeed, some go even further. 
in reflecting on Ray Paul's original intervention on the question of whose city, Andy Merrifield reminds us that Paul, only a few years later, in 1973, made it clear whose city it was. It was the capitalist city, whom Merrifield declares are nothing more than parasites. But he has an inoculation, a prophylactic against the damage that the capitalist parasites might work. And here, too, Merrifield says, that preeminent parasitic organism, the leech of landed property, the monstrous power wielded by landed property, Marx called it, expelling people from the earth as a dwelling place needs to be expunged, democratized by some community land trust that can reinvigorate a fresh notion of the public realm, one not owned and managed by, by any capitalist state, capitalized excuse me, centralized state, but owned and run by a collectivization of people, federated, communal, and truly responsive to citizens' needs. Few of those enamored of the post-political thesis would call Merrifield's argument post-political. It is political from the start. Just are the actions of the South Lincoln residents, whatever the differences in timbre and register may be. Politics proper is, in this sense, at work in Lincoln Park, La Alma, and in the Santa Fe Arts District with which it is interdigitated. But what about Stapleton? Stapleton seems to be the most non-contentious of non-contentious spaces. Five? I, I'm going to be about two or three minutes. Yeah. I might even go faster. We'll see. It's the most content, non-contentious of contentious spaces. Stapleton is a gated community, see, without walls or gates. So has a post-political order been implemented there? Maybe it has. Yet it's political in Stapleton too, if not always in ways that progressive scholars like to recognize as political. Stapleton is, according to the Sun president, the ultimate wired community, and we have a block captain network, an email tree to die for. If someone out of place is seen on the street, word gets out fast. A presumably homeless person selling a street paper in front of the main square of shops might be tolerated, but if somebody rings your doorbell at nine at night selling magazines, chances are they won't get through the whole block before the police come up and say, hi, just want to make sure you have a license to do this. If we define politics as only that which seeks to upend the dominant order, then we miss at least half the game. Upholding and maintaining the dominant order is politics too. Stapleton residents, many of them anyway, cultivate a very close relationship with the police. Sun works, worked hard to establish a cop or community-oriented policing shop in a storefront in the main shopping area where residents can do counter reports. That is, they can uh, report crimes or problems in neighborhoods where they can register their bicycle, as we were told. The cop shop is a full service shop for non-peace officer things, where the local cops, that is the peace officers, which in US context means they can use their guns, that's what peace means in the US, you can use your guns, they come in and have coffee just to, you know, so there's a presence in the community, a welcoming thing. Residents cultivate a relationship with the police and with each other as a means of instilling and upholding common interests, as the Sun president put it, or as Ranciere puts it, the police order. This is not also, if this is not also politics proper, then it's hard to know what is. Consent isn't just one, it's often mutually consult, uh, constituted. To ignore this Part of the political process is to ignore many of the ways in which contention does not arise in the spaces where one might expect it. It is to refuse to see how non-contention is the dialectical par partner to contention. And politically, it is to make a big strategic bl blunder. It is to mistake politics we do not like for a lack of politics. Under such circumstances, progressive scholars will do little more than, to quote the conservative geographer Carl Sauer, writing in a very, very different but no less political context, all we will end up doing is bag our own decoys. If we pay too little attention to what politics, what politics 
if we dismiss too much as post-political and refuse to recognize both that which we do not like and that which seems somehow minor or working within the structural constraints that we find ourselves in, if we dismiss all of that, we'll have no chance at all of answering Ray Paul's dual question of whose power and thus whose city. Ironically enough, the gradualists will win the dialogue and claim the power if only because the revolutionaries fretting about a lack of proper politics instead of uh, working politically will have forfeited the game. So, thank you. one step further and suggest that, you know, when Hansier was writing about this stuff, a bunch of his colleagues using different re registers, right. they're not, they were not providing an analysis. And so once you start translating this philosophical dualism between some category called political right. and another ca category called politics or some other version yeah. of, of normative political theory, once you start translating it into an actual analysis, you're going to have Problem. You're stuck with a kind of a, um, a register which diagnoses based on a certain set of frequency categories, yeah. and that's not analysis. Right. And so, you know, I mean, that's one point. The other point is simply to say that what we're describing is, of course, entirely um, unremarkable. Yeah. I mean, normalization as a form of politics. Right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's not new. It's not yeah. a function of the yeah. It's yeah. a function of the last generation. Right. It's always been one aspect yeah. of how politics works. Yeah. Yeah, and and I totally agree with you. Let's have a love fest here because, um, <laughs> right? Because the. To the degree that there is a post-political moment or a post-political condi condition or where politics seems absent, that is a political achievement. Right? What, what I find when I'm working through all of this stuff is we're almost reconstructing the hegemonic wheel. Right? But we're forgetting that piece of you know, how dialectically entwined consent and coercion are. Right? And, and what, we're, what we found in, in Boulder and, and Denver was a constant struggle over the relationship between consent and coercion. This is exactly what's going on. Right? Consent always had to be won, but there was always the fist of, con of, of coercion behind that. And so there was a struggle at work. And to the degree that politics faded or disappeared from the view, that was a huge political achievement. Right? It's an ongoing <laughs> political achievement. It predates neoliberalism, as you're pointing out, and so forth. Uh, just also thanks to that. I think that's an important contribution as well. Like, and I think grappling with this in the South African context as well, with also the fixation on a, a certain type of politics as being the only type of politics right. as well. And I wondered if you, because where you started about the difference between management and antagonism is something I actually have been thinking a lot about. And the antagonist, like the covering over, and in fact, through my own the kind of critique of rights, mm -hmm. it's also a bit about the covering over through management of. Um, also an antagonism. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to give you more to that. Yeah, and may, maybe the, the interesting example, and it came from one of our folks, you know, we're only quoting a couple people here, and there's a lot there. It was Steve Lawrence again, who gave us that example of people fixing their cars, right? And, and there can be a lot of contention there, because noise and grease and dirt and you, know, the, and, you know, the proper bourgeois sort of American sense of what a, a suburban neighborhood's supposed to look like and what you're supposed to do in it and so forth and all that kind of stuff. But it was all talked about at the level of a conflict between a couple of individuals. And even so, and Lawrence is a very, very clever person. He's a, he's a, by American standards, a pretty progressive guy who was running for city council at the time and so forth and, and, uh, and everything. And, but he saw it entirely in the sense of individuals, right? Individual Work. And he never got to the point of raising the question, why isn't someone moving to this neighborhood right, where they're building uh, below market rate housing might have to fix his car in the driveway? Right? What's at work? You know, 
I would, I, I, first of all, I don't have the skills. But secondly, right, I can afford to have a, a, a mechanic take care of my car. Right? A lot of people can't. First of all, there's the pride in the skills that, that a lot of people have. But secondly, they may not be able to afford to. Right? So they learn how to fix their cars themselves. And it's a crucial part of their ability to survive in a neighborhood like that. Right? And those kind of structural constraints never come in. And so the antagonism gets reduced to a cultural difference. Right? Rather than something that is. A revolutionary transformation, right? And in some ways, and in some ways, that's if I'm honest with what Rancière is talking about. That's yeah. the properly political is those moves to try and do, make that radical transformation. But part of the problem with that, that uh, we, this came up you know, with some of the discussions yesterday and so forth, part of the problem with that is the misunderstanding of, if you're thinking dialectically about this, and the ways in which kind of quantitative differences, right, just a small, or a reformist difference, can become qualitatively quite different as they build on each other, right? And if we're unattentive to the smaller struggles that where people are often working within those things where they're trying to, they, they think that something is resolvable, right? The resolutions of those might lead, can potentially lead or can be organized to lead towards a more radical transformation. And if we don't pay attention to those smaller, more uh, antagonistic Whichever I get mixed up with there's contentious issues, then we end up um, I don't know, bagging our own decoys. I just love that line. Uh, yeah. I don't know if this is on or what. It it's on. Um, You're on. The talk, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little more on the 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 symbolic politics of the aesthetics of the, these projects. And I, I say this for one particular reason, because uh, in, in April, I gave a talk at, at the University of Miami, and the plaintiffs of Ivor lived in Coral Gables in a neighborhood that was designed in, I think, in the 1930s. And their specific house, not to be too personal about the political here, but their specific house is designed in the style of a Cape Dutch farmhouse from South Africa. And I mean, to them, it's this lovely home. And right. they had a nice party, and they seem like nice people, except for the fact that he has a massive gun collection. Right. And it just seems like it was something very, and I haven't worked this all out. I clearly, yeah. <laughs> very symbolic about uh, where they live and, mm -hmm. and how they live for the, the, the principles of new urbanism. So I'm wondering if the, this sort of symbolic politics, if you will, sort of the, the way in which the aesthetics extend what is ostensibly taken as post-political, but mm -hmm. it's actually not. Right. So I'm wondering if there's an aesthetic angle on it. I'm sure there is, especially in the, the second before I want to, you know, before you give the floor to Gerhard. I'm not sure whether what I can say about that, uh, other than the ways in which, uh, like Mariposa is being replanned, re is, is fascinating in all kinds of ways. Not so much the aesthetics, but the representation of the aesthetics, and by that I mean the the city and the Denver Housing Authority engaged in a very very extensive branding process, right? This is a redevelopment of a public health program. There's all kinds of hope six. I'll, I'll get into the jargon of all this. It's a dispersal program, a decanting program for the poor and so forth. They're trying to attract people who are finding lower downtown, which is the gentrified warehouse district, too expensive, into this neighborhood, right? And so uh, the first thing that they're doing, of course, is getting rid of the public housing project because what it represents, right, is a moment in American history that is now discredited, right? Which is as close as we ever got to a social democratic moment. And what is being put in instead is a post-industrial moment. And so it's all the kind of fake post-industrial chic 
that is being put in there with, with brand new fake lofts and fake warehouses and, and everything else. All around these sorts of things. Yeah, this is all exactly what this is going to do. Of course, it looks just like every other redevelopment that there is. But, um, but it's all designed to attract a certain kind of person around a certain kind of aesthetic, right? And they have names for all of them. I've forgotten what they all are, but they've got names for all of these, these folks. They're not the gun toters, but, um, <laughs> but, but, but the, the planners themselves and certainly the marketers of it are highly, highly attentive to the... Um, to, to the aesthetics of it and how the aesthetics will then draw in a certain demographic, right, to use exactly their language. Um, and where all of the historical reference are, right, just constantly get, well, they, they get made up in that case, right? And so I'm not entirely sure what's being important. It's not um, Kate, D the Dutch uh, houses in that instance. But there are unsavory histories in, in Denver that are, are being recreated and in interesting ways. Um, some of the shotgun house styles, right, that were, came essentially from the south, uh, which are important in Denver, get recreated as kind of yuppie housing now. And so that gets erased too. Okay, uh, since we uh, already uh, took minutes to the maybe we will have more uh, discussion after the <coughs> presentation from Gerhardt. Uh, uh, on oh, no, Kofsky. Like, okay. Kind of. Oh, And Tosh show Mr. Uch. Mr. Uch. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay.